there's a lot of talk about small change and incremental changes. And I don't think anyone has an argument with that, but is there, um, perhaps you could give us uh, some ideas or guidance or suggestions around when incremental is enough uh, and when disruption isn't disruptive uh, around innovation. So small is good, but when it's big, better. I mean, 1787, the French Revolution wouldn't have been achieved through incremental change. I think, I, th I think that was a good example. Um, since then, I'm not really sure. Um, the challenge, I think, is to get those changes, as we saw in the discussion of exponential improvement, is getting changes or that, that build on each other, that, that continue to accelerate the pace of doing those things. Um, I know there's been some, some criticism today about the notion that we need some revolutionary change or, or, or something like that. I'm just not going to, I just don't think that's right. But having said that, you should remember that in order to get change, you need dissatisfaction. And that people at the top of, sorry, <laughs> people at the top of organisations aren't dissatisfied. Um, and as a consequence, you're less likely to see those sorts of changes. Um, what you really need to see is people, junior people in the organisation, putting forward ideas, looking to buy, for ways to improve things, because the people at the top of organisations understand the need to improve, understand the need to be more effective and those sorts of things. So it's a question of balancing the people with the ideas with the people who can make them happen. And, my notion, therefore, is that hierarchy isn't a blockage to good ideas, but the ladder by which they reach the top. Anybody else? Step in now. Yeah, I I was just going to say there are um, those uh, pattern changing, pattern breaking technologies, I think, where you can justify. Um, um, what's the word? <laughs> I've just I'm focused on the incremental revolution, um, yeah. disruptive, disruptive innovation. Um, you know, the PC obviously came along and that uh, uh, changed things up quite considerably during the during the nineties. Um, um, Software-wise, uh, the Excel spreadsheet is always touted as one of those big game changers. Um, uh, you know, but I don't think you see them too often. I think we've now hit the spot on the curve with that sort of thing where I could be wrong, but we're going to see um, less and less revolution and more and more evolution. Yeah. I was just going to say basically a little bit of that, but the revolution versus evolution thing, I think what we've seen over hundreds of years, like, I mean, if you look at thousands of years, sort of, you know, the, the, the quality of life and the individual empowerment sort of floated down here, sometimes dipped a little, sometimes came up a little bit, stayed pretty low. In the last couple hundred years, the concept of an individual having a right, you know, entered the fray, and that sort of saw a bit of a tilt up and sort of slow evolution again over maybe 100 years or so, and then sort of stuff got up. And what's happened in the last, I mean, the internet, a lot of people say the internet is the change, but actually, no, the, in, the internet is just part of this broader picture of just massive um, uh, evolution of, of quality of life, of empowerment of individual rights, individuals being able to do great things. Um, and so what we've seen, I think, is a shift of power from the, the entities or the, the organisations to the individual, which is quite interesting. So in terms of revolution, this comes back to um, hyperbole. <coughs> uh, there's a fantastic poster that says, um, uh, hyper, uh, hyperbole is literally going to kill everything. Um, you know, the, the, this one, I think we see a lot of hyperbole. And people talk about, you know, if they don't see yeah. this exact thing yeah. in this exact yeah. way, then everything's bad, everything's dead. I think maintaining a sense of context, the amount of times I get an, an, an email from someone that says, urgent, it's like, really? Is it? <laughs> yes. for this reason, but not just being reactive to all the things, realising that, you know, um, uh, within the first couple of weeks of my job, I took a, a bunch of tasks that were very manual and automated them uh, so that I could free up time so I could do things that I really wanted to do. Um, so in your jobs, um, that evolutionary change is revolutionary. 
because then it raises the bar for everyone. I think it's a really good question, uh, and I think it's, the answer to it is it's very situational. Uh, if I was sitting in Australia Post at the moment, uh, and working for that organisation, I would say that uh, incremental change wouldn't protect my job, because I may not be there within the next five years. Um, so that's an organisation that really is driving a lot of revolutionary change. Uh, I used the example earlier of the, um, some of the institutions within the higher education sector. Uh, they maybe quite don't know it yet, but um, they're ready for some revolutionary change. Incremental change within that sector maybe might not get them to where they need to be. Um, as part of my research around talking to innovation officers uh, within some of the technology organisations, I sat down with the, uh, the chief digital officer of FPOS, you know the electronic payments guys? Where do you think they're going to be if Bitcoin comes off? <laughs> So it depends on, it's situational. Some organizations will need to really have revolution and have that groundbreaking um, transformation, and other organizations will have the, you know, a little bit more time to make incremental changes. I'll uh, differ slightly with John on that thing. I think if organizations had incremental changes along their way, they would need less of the revolutionary changes. So I think it's about how we get organizations every day to make incremental changes over time, they will be revolutionary mm. in total. Mm. It's, it's how you get the culture of that little change every day adds up to a big change. Mm -hmm. If they don't have a pitchfork, it's not really a revolution, is it? We've been using the metaphor of evolution, and of course, uh, we're an incredibly com uh, complex. Uh, uh, carbon-based organism standing here that are the end result of um, four billion years of incremental change. Uh, hopefully things won't take that long, but the public service at some time. You're assuming you're the end result. <laughs> and I might be. Um, the, the, only, the only other thing I'd like to add to this is that um, so John's uh, viewpoint was organisations need revolution occasionally, and that's probably true. But what can you do it to affect revolution? Probably very little. Um, but every individual can affect um, uh, incremental innovation in their workplace, share influence, uh, make it happen, um, even if it's simply the other day I made a macro so that I could insert a JPEG of my signature onto a letter because I won't go into it. Go on, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's told that some a pretty picture of my signature is needed on an electronic document, so I made a macro so I could with a click of a button. It's incremental. It's saving me 15 <laughs> seconds on a job, but it's saving me 15 seconds. Michelle? Mm -hmm. Uh, no, John pinched mine, so I'm, I was thinking of coming to the next question. Next question for Michelle. Next question, please. Well, Michelle, an unnamed government department. Um, my question is around enterprise architecture, and so I'm going to a quick skill about what that is um, for those who are not aware as to what that is. Yes, probably this week, um, aimed at maybe the CTO up here, but the rest of the panel would be good as well. So, enterprise architecture, the way that the Australian government has put together our particular model links basically a vision and purpose for an organisation all the way down to various layers of service that we need to eventually data and what we need on the ground or the below. I work in risk, I see for knowledge organisations, this is one of the fundamental key controls that most organisations need to manage risk in what they're doing. To build on the themes of today, we've been talking about exponential growth, about doing things that build upon each other to eventually get us to a really good point. And we've also spoken about constraints and how they help us with innovation as well. I see enterprise architecture as providing that guidance in that direction so that all this innovation that happens across the board is sort of channeled in a singular direction. So two questions. One is, do we see enterprise architecture as being an enabler or entwined with innovation as a government? And the second one is, what is the future and direction of this? I'm seeing lots of agencies not using the standard that we've put in place and putting instead open standards and using that, which doesn't necessarily hit part of what we're looking at or what has been developed so far within the project. 
I guess I'd say that this is an area of complex discussion. What, what enterprise architecture seeks to do, I think, is provide the connection between business and, and technology through the notion of business processes very carefully. But essentially, an enterprise architecture framework for an organisation is a set of rules about the organisation. And rules, I think, are for the guidance of wise men and the obedience of fools. And I think this is the challenge we see in any sort of framework that can't be interpreted by people according to the context in which they find themselves. Um, it's possible, and indeed I have done, a lot of work in exploring enterprise architecture and organisations, in setting up business process frameworks and looking at those sorts of those sorts of arrangements over time. But to themselves, they can become, the means has become the end. And I think it, enterprise architecture maintaining it is a lot like painting the proverbial harbour bridge. When you get to one end, you have to start again. And we just need to be a little more careful about those things. The principles behind that sort of duel, I think, are fine. The Australian Government Architecture Framework has a place in what it is doing and describing services and their connections, but they're rules to be interpreted by wise men and women, not necessarily things to be followed blindly. Can I have Can I stop you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone didn't hear it. John just said, could I stop you? Um, the, I think also it's about um, organisations understanding why it's useful for them to, to use the standards and to use the rules. Um, so, and, and I think data is an interesting, although much, much, much smaller um, example for this, I guess parallel example for this, because for a long time organisations have seen the concept of open data as a retrospective, painful, you know, um, resource intensive kind of thing. And, um, and when they start to see, oh, here's how it can actually benefit my organisation, then they want to do it. And then, they, and then they increasingly, over time, want to do it in a better way. And then they sort of go, oh, so if we put it up in PDF, we get this much value. If we put it up in a machine readable format that can create an API, we get this much value. If we, you know, just almost taking people along the path a little bit. And I, I do think that the, the challenge for agencies to deliver the end-to-end -end services has, has got much harder in recent times, particularly with resource constraints. Um, and particularly with the amount of devices that we have to, to support. And so taking a more modular um, approach is, I think, challenging a lot of the traditional um, enterprise architecture kind of models in some ways, although you know, arguably should be done that way in the first case in some cases. Um, and, um, and I do think that this new digital design guide and service standard creates an opportunity to start get back to good principles around this stuff for the reason of it's going to help you do your job better as opposed to because it's a good thing to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. I have nothing to add. Too complex for me. Hmm? <laughs> Actually, I'll point out to John that it's an actual Sydney Harbour Bridge, bri bri not a proverbial one. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it. <laughs> I didn't say which harbour. <laughs> <laughs> Any of our other speakers you want to add to that at all? One more question? Anybody got a question? When's the next conference? Next year, this time next year. <laughs> so, yeah. Pass the baton. <laughs> Hi, I'm Erin Russell, I work in the CAO for Aging and Defence. Um, while I appreciate all of the Apple examples and the Albert Einstein's and all of that, I was wondering if you actually have any good examples of innovation in government or groups that you know are doing well or departments or organisations, so any good news stories you could share to finish up? There's heaps of those examples. The, the, work, the, the work that DHS has done in mobile applications for um, benefits and things like that was done quickly, um, professionally, and has changed the way that people are claiming benefits um, all, all the time, I think. It's been really fascinating to see how relatively few resources was required to do that sort of work. Um, the use um, by ABS at the time of the last census of social media to promote the census was a leading way of using social media as a campaign tool that wasn't reflected in other places. I actually think that Defence's um, next generation desktop on an enormous scale is going to change 
how people view the way that they would use the technology on their, on their desktop, reducing the number of systems they need and saving money in those circumstances as well. Uh, these examples are everywhere. I, I think the reticence of government to speak about them it comes from the notion that uh, that having done that, it, it almost invites challenge from the media. A, a sense of hubris has developed or, or something like that, that. That really makes it difficult for government to talk about those good, those good examples. But there are, there are any number of them that, that we could um, go on about all, all the time that improve things. This year, we put the um, budget data on data.gov.au just after the budget was released so that instead of having to have people go through and scrape the PDF files and create their own tables, that data was accessible to people, what would be 12 hours or something less, like this? Yeah. Yeah, less than that, um, on, on data.gov.au and that was just one small little um, example. But there really are lots and lots. And I certainly don't mean that there's a negative thing. I mean, I, I know there is, and it's, um, we know a lot of work in our group alone that's quite innovative and forward leading and all of that. So it's more about how we can learn. I mean, this kind of forum is exactly what's going to achieve that. So it's just finding out where the yeah. other areas are. Yeah. I think the big thing that's probably affected the citizenry, and I think it's visible, is the work that uh, has been done by Human Services and um, integrating the customer services and. <coughs> I don't know all the details, but it, it seems mammoth for what they've done down there. I say down there because you're a tug on. <laughs> 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 um, sure you're right, there's lots of examples, but the, weirdly enough, one of my favourite ones I saw in the launch video from yesterday, mm. which was um, the, the, I forget which department it was, but, um, but they have letters that they sent out to ageing citizens, and um, there was a real problem with confusion of you know, when the letter came and all the rest of it. It was just the tiniest. The funniest thing they did was tax. Yeah. So they changed the colour of the envelope. Right? And all that did was make it much easier that people knew when it came and they, they cut their call rates significantly because suddenly people could identify the tax letter from the other letters. It's such a small thing. Such a, that, that to me is real innovation. Innovation doesn't have to be shiny. In all the cases, it's not shiny. Someone will come to you and give you something you know, super shiny. But it's, it, it's actually if, you help, if it helps you do what you're trying to do better. That, for me, I guess is really basic, which is again where I get back to tangible outcomes. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of reasons. And, and, and feel free to talk to me on the Public Sector Innovation Network oh, in case you do. Oh, Thomas. Oh, Thomas. Thomas. <laughs> no, they sure. all no. took their head and said no. Yeah. Alright, I think I might wrap that up, but before I do, can we have three takeaway messages for our audience from each speaker? <laughs> so I've got an innovation preferably. It's painful. <laughs> <laughs> we can have one each, that is one. One? Okay. Well, I don't have The bank's going last. Okay, let's start with Peter. No! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one takeaway message about innovation. One takeaway message. Oh, beautiful. Got to get, got to ask yourself three questions when you're walking into your little cubicle in the morning. What am I doing today? Why am I doing that? And how can I do it differently? That's Thank just you. about setting our minds thinking what we do. How can we innovate every single day? Thank you. Um, I'd like two, please, if possible. Um, <laughs> have up to three. I can have up to three. I can't count that far. <laughs> um, the, the first one will be uh, to actually bring the point that I made in the presentation, bring the value of innovation to the fore within the uh, recruitment and development and assessment processes. Um, I thought it was very striking that a lot of people in the room said that they're involved in recruitment and development and assessment, um, but not very many people were able to kind of keep their hands up when we talked about um, is that included within the recruitment and development processes. Um, and the second thing that I would say is, I think a number of speakers have said it, is try it. Don't hold back. Um, small steps, make it happen. The leaders are not at the top of the organisation, at the top of the tower. The leaders are in this room. Can you give us an example of how you use innovation in your recruitment processes? Well, one of the ways to do that was, was actually we, we made the innovation a topic. Um, so one of the key things was that if we understand that innovation is important to us because transformation is important to us, and um, it's back to this part of the debate about is it incremental um, transformation or is it revolutionary transformation? The answer is it's both. But if we don't have any, if we don't have innovation on the topic, 
or even included as part of the process, how do we expect to recruit innovative people? <coughs> so, yeah, as I said earlier in the presentation, it doesn't mean to say that you have to do a lot more work, you just have to focus on different things. If you don't have a clear business name, why are you doing it? For fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. If you, don't have, if you don't have a clear business name and it's not fun, oh, they're totally why different. are you doing it? Okay, it's a good one. Fail fast, fail cheap and learn. And if you don't want to change, you're going to like it rather than say it was. I think innovation is a spectator sport. And for every Israel Folau, there's got to be a whole lot of people in front of him who do the hard yards and the incremental work to get the ball so the innovation champion can run with it. And I think in the public service, what we're seeing is there are people prepared to do that. Um, and we need to keep doing that because I think together we can change things by doing that sort of work. As an innovation champion, I'm, uh, I'm uh, pleased to be like to Israel for Wow. That's <laughs> cool. He thought um, I was going to be Twitter followers of you too. Almost. <laughs> so, um, I might take a little time here because I just want to write, relate some anecdotes. Because um, I didn't get to do a presentation or anything. Um, <laughs> so, I think the key message is that you can make a difference. But in doing that, you've got to be careful about. Uh, uh, how you go about it, um, because there are barriers, there are blockers, um, and uh, you need to be, you need to recognise those and find ways to work around them. And I'm going to give you a couple of anecdotes, which are probably going to teach you things that you I shouldn't really be teaching you. <laughs> anyway, um, so in a past life, I was running a grant program. Uh, it was the first time I ever ran a grant program. Um, they were getting handwritten applications and then transferring, typing into to an Excel spreadsheet, um, no details of names and addresses, and I just looked at that and was horrified. Um, so I spent my weekends programming um, forms, yeah, both Word and PDF forms, um, that would automatically extract data into the Excel spreadsheet for them um, to save them time and to, to put them on a path of doing interesting work. Um, and so I did all that, and it worked, and they loved it. Um, and then we started telling other great program managers about what we were doing, and then they started asking IT security. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so IT security said, oh no, you can't do that. The email is not secure. Um, it has to be handwritten application. And I just went, well, they didn't tell me that. Because um, I didn't ask them. So you've got. <laughs> <laughs> so you just got to think. Forgiveness. Well, you know, I mean, to, you know, it wasn't the IT people I work with now, they're wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, and, you know, they were doing their risk assessments. Um, but they weren't doing they weren't doing comparative risk. They weren't doing comparative risk between um, uh, the sclerosis on business because of an old practice of working paper, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, versus the convenience of um, getting the material in electronically. Um, they just did the risk on getting that stuff in, and they said there's a risk, and we're not going to do that. Well, um, I do comparative risk when I do these things. Um, the second, second story is, I guess, um, uh, very, very current. So, um, we're all friends here. No one's going to dog me in. Shut down Twitter. Um, <laughs> but I'm embarking on a process within my branch um, of continuous business improvement. That sounds wonderful. I've adopted a methodology for that. That's lean thinking. Um, and I'm starting small and incrementally and building up with this. Um, I'm sharing this with members of my hierarchy and my peers that I think will support it, and I'm not sharing it with some members of my hierarchy and peers who I think have the power to shut me down. Um, and I think might. Uh, so I'm working through the process to get the runs on the board to come up with some very real figures so that when I 
start to spread it around, um, my case is irrefutable. So you, you've got to pick your battles. So you can do it, and you've got to pick your battles. I'll take three points, but just very quick ones. The first one is find allies. Find great people, find clever people, surround yourself with people smarter than you. I, I do, I try and surround myself with people smarter than me all the time. And they will help inspire you, support you, and help you when you really want to hit your head through the brick wall. You, you know there's other people you know, that, that are in the same position and you're all going to break through it together. Um, the second one is um, precedence. This is a weird one, but if you can find someone else that's done before, everyone seems to be happy to be the first to go second. So um, part of the value of this network of allies is identifying opportunities um, where people have already done it so you can mitigate the risk you manage it. My final one, sorry, do you want to write that down? No, 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 I, 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 no you can go, go. I, no, I want to finish. Oh, serious? I just wanted to make a comment on everyone wants to go second. There was a great TED talk on this. Um, and it's called, uh, it's about being the, the importance of being the, 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 uh, the first follower. Um, and so, I, I could just describe it, but it's, it's great. It's got this vision at a rock concert of this guy in shorts and no shirt dancing around. I did this all by himself. He looks like a complete crap. Um, as did you. As I did, yes. Yeah. Um, but, but as you watch the vision, a second guy comes and joins him and starts, um, starts dancing in exactly the same way, looking like the exact same prat. And the first prat shows the second prat, giving some lessons on how to do it. <laughs> now we've got two prats, and then there's three, and eight, and ten, and fifty, and a hundred, in about ninety seconds. It's fantastic. First follower, um, it's on ten. Um, my final point, and I think this is the... <laughs> <laughs> um, I know, and I, this underpins everything because I've talked about collaboration and there's been some fantastic points from, from all the other speakers here and it's been really a wonderful day. But my final point is just be awesome. Because if you are aiming for greatness, if you are doing awesomeness, if you're trying to be the most awesome version of yourself, if you are aiming for awesomeness, then you're naturally going to have fun doing it, which means it's probably going to be done better. Um, you're naturally going to be motivated to figure out how to do it the best way you can, not the way that's already defined in that existing framework that was developed 10 years ago. Um, you're naturally going to seek out allies, you're naturally going to come up with great outcomes, you're naturally going to make everyone happy, um, which means that you can progress, which means you get the trust, which means everything else follows. If you aim for awesomeness, how many people have read Zen the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? Everyone else just please read it. It gets a little weird, I apologise for that, but the core concept in it, and again I might say if you're reading another book, the core concept of quality means you put yourself utterly into something. You put you, and if you put yourself completely into something, it will be epic. It won't just be a task or a process or a job. It will be epic. So it just be awesome.